Well, hello and welcome to Science Never Stops. I'm your host, Joseph Vick, with the U.S. Space and Rocket Center, here this morning with NASA Marshall Space Flight Center guest, gravitational wave astrophysicist, Dr. Tyson Littenberg. Welcome, Dr. Littenberg, to Science Never Stops. Hi. All right, so let's get started with our first question. I have here, could you please explain to our viewers your field of study and tell us about some current NASA projects you're working on. Okay, so my field of study uh, is the study of gravitational waves, which is a phenomenon that was predicted by Albert Einstein over 100 years ago, but only first ever observed in 2015 by the LIGO detectors. LIGO is a National Science Foundation funded program that we here at NASA Marshall help out with some of their data analysis and interpretation. There are two LIGO detectors in the United States, one in Louisiana and one in central Washington state. And then there's a third detector in Italy called Virgo that also participates in the sort of global gravitational wave network, uh, combining data to do uh, those observations. NASA uses lots of acronyms. Could you let us know what the acronym LIGO stands for? Oh, yes. So LIGO is the Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory, which is why we use lots of acronyms. Yes. LIGO is an awful lot easier. Virgo is not an acronym. Virgo is just named for the constellation. And then in the in the near future, the there is a, a mission under development led by the European Space Agency called the Laser Interferometer Space Antenna, or LISA. And NASA is partnering with the European Space Agency to get LISA off of the ground. And so a lot of the work that we do at Marshall is similar to what we've done with LIGO so far, developing the sort of computational tools that we'll need to analyze the data and interpret the results, and now developing the similar tools for LISA once it's operational. So since there's Virgo and there's LIGO, which is ground-based operations. And is it similar to NASA's sort of, in perspective, a great observatory where you have some sort of filtered atmospheric disturbance looking out, but if LISA is out past that atmospheric disturbance, is there a greater chance to pick up, I guess, bigger, more undisturbed gravitational wave? Yeah. Uh, I. I really like the great observatories analogy. Uh, and using that analogy, LIGO and Virgo are the high energy observatories. So they see the, the very short wavelength gravitational waves. So they would be like your, your X-ray and your gamma ray detectors, where uh, LISA will observe gravitational waves at lower frequency that you cannot observe from the ground, not due to the atmosphere absorbing the signals, but due to the fact that the Earth just jiggles too much for these detectors, which have to be very sensitive. And so if if LIGO and Virgo are like the, the Chandra of the gravitational wave world, then LISA would be like the Hubble of the gravitational wave world. I had not thought about that with gravitational waves. When you are looking at something that is sort of recessed or within the ground of the Earth and the Earth is living and vibrates, you have to cancel out the seismology of the Earth calculations yeah. to oh yeah so one of the one of the great technological advancements that makes LIGO possible is something called uh, active seismic isolation where the the instruments that make up LIGO uh, are sort of actively sensing the the motion of the ground and then trying to compensate that to hold the instrument as still as possible so it can measure the very small changes due to the gravitational waves. But when you get to low frequencies, below about one hertz, there's just nothing you can do to cancel out the sort of gravitational disturbances on the Earth, so you have to go to space. Well, that is some fascinating science that's going on on Earth and soon to be outside of Earth operations. So with that, this fascinating topic, could you tell us a little bit about your educational background and how that helped you obtain your current NASA position? So I went to college at a small state school in upstate New York, and I actually started off as a, as a physics education major. I wanted to teach high school physics, but each physics class I took was more and more interesting. And no offense to my educators out there, but each education class I took was a little bit less interesting. 
Uh, so a couple of years into my degree, I changed my major to physics and got to the end of my bachelor's. And the more you know about physics, the more you realize you don't know. So I went to graduate school to get even more confused and ended up with a PhD, which is sort of the, the requirement for um, a, a sort of professional research scientist type position. Did you any, do any uh, postdoctoral work? Oh yes, so my, my graduate school life was in Montana, at Montana State University. And then I did two postdocs, one in Washington DC at NASA Goddard Space Flight Center. So that was my first taste of NASA. And then I went to Northwestern University near Chicago, which is where I got really involved in the LIGO experiment. And then through a slightly circuitous path, I ended up at NASA Marshall. And they are very pleased, I'm sure, to have you. All your research that you're doing is opening doors to things we do not know. Uh, well, with your academic background and what you've done, what would you say would be your biggest academic or career setback? Because all scientists go through bumps in the road, whether it be discoveries or science experiments that go wrong. So what in your life have you come across within either academic or career? Then tell us how you overcame it. Everyone does face setbacks in, in this business. There are uh, highs and lows when it comes to just figuring out where you're going to live and what you're going to do for a living. So the, the process of going through your postdoctoral years to ending up with a permanent position can be extremely stressful. And, and we had some bumps in the road there trying to figure out exactly uh, what the long-term career was going to be like, but we managed to land in a really good place. Uh, you mentioned <clears throat> this scientist earlier, and I think this may be the answer to this question, but what would you say is your favorite scientist and why? So I'm not going to say Einstein because that's too easy. Okay. Um, so my favorite scientist, Einstein is a close second, would probably be Richard Feynman. Richard Feynman uh, was one of those lightning in a bottle type scientists who understood in great depth a very broad range of topics when you're when you're in school you learn that there are only really four types of physics problems and then you're insulted when your professors tell you that you know all physics is the same and yet our research ended up being very specialized but but Feynman was one of those scientists who really did see it as it's all just physics and was able to make dramatic cross-cutting advances in many different fields because of this really deep fundamental understanding of how the universe works. But paired with that was an excellent ability to communicate that information to people easily enough that for a brief moment when reading Feynman, you think you actually understand physics at the same level that, that, that Feynman did. Oftentimes those, those great science communicators have a research background but really their, their role is to filter the, the research community's output to be good input for the general public. And Feynman was able to do both. Do you happen to have any special abilities, talents, hobbies that might surprise people? So I, I used to fancy myself as a bit of an artist. And actually before college, I really debated whether or not to go to art school or to go into physics and education. What medium did you work with? Drawing and painting, mostly, uh, some calligraphy. Uh, and, and I was tricked because, because someone told me that physicists can do art, but artists can't do physics. So I decided to be a physicist and found out I had no time to do any art. <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to take advantage of my extra time at home now to sort of shake the rust off of that side of my brain. Would you happen to have a personal motto or a bit of advice to pass along to the next NASA career generation? Since you are current NASA career generation, what would you like to say or sort of give some sort of encouragement to that next generation? So if you set out to be a physicist or an astronomer or a NASA engineer or any of the above, you're going to encounter a lot of really, really smart people. And along the way, you're probably gonna feel like you maybe don't belong in that crowd. And everyone says it, but no one believes it. Every single smart person you talk to 
is thinking to themselves, boy, I'm surrounded by a really lot of smart people and I don't know if I can cut it in this crowd. So scientists, engineers, they're all just people too. They just happen to get very, very obsessed over a very technical challenge. And if you also want to get obsessed over that technical challenge, then you belong in that group of scientists and engineers as well. Well, thank you again, uh, Dr. Littenberg, for enjoy uh, joining us today. And uh, for our viewers, remember, science never stops. <laughs> <laughs>